then you get a more viscous drag, of course. But the dramatic thing that happens is when you when you get separation on the back of the wing, what effectively happens is if you think about the air can't bend around the wing fast enough, you're left, left with a low pressure area behind the wing. You've got a pressure drag that comes in. It has a significant amount of drag. These birds are basically hitting the air brakes and coming to a stop in a dramatic fashion. And despite being basically having this parachute out, exposing them to an enormous amount of drag, they're still doing exquisite landings, like hitting a branch on a tree. This we can only hit a carrier, right? So we're going to have to see if we can try to make a plane do that. <clears throat> Tried to build the simplest possible plane that could, that could reproduce that sort, of, um, that sort of a result. It's a glider, there's no propeller. <clears throat> it's got flat plate wings. The wings are, are bent up with some dihedral, so they had passive stability in, in roll. It basically has no interesting dynamics out of plane. It's only interesting in the longitudinal plane. It's just got one actuator, which is the elevator, remotely controlled, off-board sensing and controls. It's got in a motion capture environment. You can see the motion capture markers. Okay. We set up the experiment where we would shoot into a motion capture arena at about six meters per second high, or seven, eight meters per second. Uh, we put a piece of wire across the lab about three and a half meters away, and we made sure that the trajectories didn't last more than a second, just so it couldn't like fly around the room and get rid of its energy that way. And the claim was, in order to accomplish this, to land on the perch with those specs, you had to be exploiting a pressure drag. Okay, and we can do that now. We can do it pretty uh, robustly, pretty efficiently. This is slowed down about eleven times. This is plane being launched in, it's now at an exceedingly high angle of attack, this is the wire thrown across the room, and we can land on a, on a perch reliably now. About 19 out of 20 times from a pretty, pretty huge range of uh, initial conditions, indoors. Okay, so this is just to show another another couple of videos of it. Uh, the hardest part of the, uh, once we got it working, the, the hardest part was getting these high-speed videos without interfering with, with mocap because of the lighting conditions and everything, but we have a few videos of it, of the landing. Nicely, we uh, got together with Mark Kakoski's lab at Stanford, brought some of his perching spines over, and we can do the same controllers to land on, on a wall. Uh, the Air Force wants us to land on a power line to triple charge the battery. It turns out there's always people that wanted perching aircraft. We just thought it was a fun problem, but it's, it turned out to be kind of a fun problem for applications, too. OK, so that's one example of the type of control problem that I want to talk about trying to solve. <clears throat> Um, just to convince you that it was hard, that we were in a, diff a difficult dynamic regime, here's a smoke visualization of the perching plane during flight. We just released smoke from the leading edge, and you can see that the, the wake is dominated by these vortices that are shed off the back of the wing. Was that closed loop control? Or it's absolutely closed loop. It does not, I mean, open loop, we just miss the perch every time. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you the story about how we make that control. Uh, so the experiment sort of demonstrated that the post stall flow does not imply a complete loss of aerodynamic or control authority. A lot of people sort of assume that you're supposed to all your control authority is gone. It's certainly diminished, more complicated, but you still have some authority. And we, in an experiment, we get about four times more drag scale than you know, the best runway landings just because we've got a bone plane that we're willing to go up into really high angle attack and do these experiments. Here's a completely different example from the other side of my, uh, my other world of walking robots. This is a little dog robot. This is Built by Boston Dynamics to be a miniature big dog. Uh, unlike big dog, it's got motion capture markers and work walks on known terrain, and it's expected to go over terrain that's a significant fraction of its life length. Big dog um, moves around blind. Little dog's supposed to plan over very complicated terrain. Um, and in fact, early on in the program, this was a DARPA program. A number of schools got these little dog robots, and we're, we're forced to race our dogs every month, uh, which wasn't great. But you see, you'll see at the end of the videos, we always dive for the goal to try to you know, beat CMU that day, right? So, um, uh, but the, by, by the middle of the program, um, people were doing pretty well uh, planning kinematic trajectories. Um, there were timing constraints on how long you were allowed to plan, like a minute of planning time. And you could plan pretty sophisticated trajectories for walking over rough terrain where, where obstacle, you know, you had to move your legs around obstacles. There were pretty significant kinematic constraints. <clears throat> Uh, we got a little bit more dynamic when they can put things like steps in front of us. We, um, we find a way to scoot up the, um, the steps. It's still much slower and more embarrassing than your dog at home, but uh, we were pretty happy. that we could walk sort of kinematically over the rough terrain. Those, were, those gates were almost dynamic. Um, uh, but then now we want much more out of Little Dog Robo. We're trying to make him bound 
Um, this is little dog bounding on flat terrain. Uh, bounding is incredibly hard because its motors are saturated almost completely. This is the most dynamic game we could find little dogs mechanically capable of doing. And now we're trying to, I'm going to tell you about trying to bound on rough terrain. Okay. So perching on a wire, bounding on rough terrain, these are two examples from our work of, of experiments that we want to be able to do to be able to synthesize very high performance controllers for. So the question is how the heck do you do that, right? So it's hard for a few reasons. First of all, in both cases, the dynamics of the plant were very known, okay? Um, we also had limited control authority. In the, um, in the perching plane case, you could just count. I had one actuator and seven degrees of freedom, roughly. You think of the elevator as being a inertialist. Um, the motors, in both cases, are saturated most of the time. We've got a little thinky um, actuator on the, uh, on the glider. We've got relatively big actuators on Little Dog, but we're pushing them to their velocity. Uh, and basically, those two things add up to say, you know, the nonlinear dynamics we had before, those, those matter. I can't just squish my dynamics with feedback, right? So the nonlinearities matter. And I don't think these are artificial examples, right? So you give me your favorite robot, and I'll try to move it fast enough that, that the dynamics matter, right? So uh, it's, I think as soon as our robots start really pushing the dynamic limits of what they can do, then I think these effects are going to be real. The other thing that, that Little Dog in particular demonstrated is some of these problems are are not just dynamically hard, but they're sort of combinatorically hard, right? So planning over rough terrain, for instance, there's, you, have, you have a combinatorial problem, you know, almost like playing chess. If I, do, I, do I put my foot on this rock or just jump over that rock, go to the next rock? And there's something that feels naturally like a planning problem expressed in there too. So we want to somehow marry the two types of um, techniques. So how do we design high performance nonlinear controllers with limited control authority? I want to tell you a way that we are combining the combinatorial planning um, type algorithms with convex optimization based nonlinear design and verification. Okay? So let's talk first about nonlinear dynamics. Okay, so um, how do we address the nonlinear dynamics of the machine? I want to start with talking about tools we're using for analyzing the local stability of the nonlinear systems. I want to um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to convince you that if we can just analyze, if we can efficiently analyze the stability of the system, in the, throughout the you know throughout controls, there's been there's been ex examples of, of being able to efficiently analyze stability, leading to that better control design. The bus control that's certainly true, and lots of places that's been true. So um, I'm going to tell you quickly about the Apollo function-based approach. I have slides, but I think it'd be a little bit more fun if I do it on the whiteboard. Okay, so so let's do it on the whiteboard. Let me just how many people think about the Apollo functions all the time? Yeah. Okay, not everybody. I'll do it. Let me just quickly motivate. The Apanoff functions, and I'll get to the good stuff. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you eat the Apanoff functions for breakfast, then, then bear with me for just a minute, and we'll, we'll get back. Okay, so um, let me just motivate the Apanoff functions. Here's, here's sort of the simplest robot I could possibly imagine. Imagine I have a, a simple pendulum, okay, um, with mass m, point mass m, a uh, link length l, uh, just parameterized by theta in a gravity field. Yeah. All right, so um, I can write down the equations of motion of this real easily, ML squared theta double dot, I'll give it a little damping, plus theta dot plus MGL sine theta equals zero, no problem. <clears throat> okay, so given a differential equation description of the system, I should be able to ask you simple questions like, if I give you theta at time zero, and the initial conditions are theta dot at time zero, then I'd like you to tell me what's theta for the rest of the time. A simple, fair question for any differential equation. The embarrassing thing, I guess, is that I, I can't tell you the answer, right? Uh, we, the, the simple pendulum is enough to break my ability to analytically solve that, to break anybody's ability. There's no sort of closed form solution. Even if I took the damping out, the solution would have elliptic intervals of the first kind, and it's not really uh, useful. If I put the damping back in, I don't even, I don't even have anything to give you. Okay, so. Uh, if we're talking about analyzing the dynamics of our pretty complicated nonlinear machines, that, that happened right by just because of the sign sitting here. If that was, that was just theta, I could, I could just do linear analysis on it, but as soon as that sign got in there, it broke everything. <clears throat> so the prospects look a little grim. How am I supposed to analyze the complex dynamics of a perching airplane if I can't even analyze the dynamics of a pendulum, right? Um, okay, all is not lost. There's a couple things I can say about the pendulum very quickly. So. Uh, I'm pretty sure, for instance, that if I watch it long enough, that the final condition is going to be at the bottom. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, right? So the, 
I think the final condition, theta at time infinity is going to be at the bottom. And why do I know that? You know, mathematically, why do I know that? I could write down the energy of the system, right? So the energy of that system is just, um, what is it, 1 half m l theta dot squared, right? Plus mgl 1 minus cos maybe, theta, right? And actually, if I look at that, because I have damping, I don't even have to do the numbers, you know, because it's got damping, I know that the energy is always going to be going down, right? So the energy is always going to be going down until the energy hits zero, and then it's going to stop at zero. So energy is zero, it's going to be zero. So that implies that the energy is going to go to zero just by looking at the energy, the di time dynamics of the energy, and that actually is going to imply that x is, or theta is going to go to zero too, just by looking at the, the energy. The scalar functions would be easy to evaluate. Much simpler than solving the actual dynamics, right? And that's exactly the idea of the optimal functions, all right? So, I, I, and oftentimes, if I can find some function, energy-like function, that has these kind of properties that, that is always going downhill, then I can make, and often those dynamics are much simpler than, the, than actually integrating the forward dynamics of the system. As long as it's going downhill, I can make long-term statements about it. This actually gives me more than convergence, right? Have, knowing this energy lets me know a few other things about the pendulum. It tells me about set invariance. Okay, so I can tell you some states. If you give me the initial conditions, I'll tell you some states that will never be visited, right? So if I, if I tell you the initial conditions here with zero velocity, you can tell me right away it's never going to go here, it's never going to go here, right? So the energy, it'll never go to a state where the energy is higher than the initial energy. Okay, and that's, that's the idea. That's, that's one way to talk about a set invariance of the dynamic system, okay? All right, so in general, a Lyapunov function is just a scalar function. A scalar function v, which is some function of the state, will make it always greater than zero, except for the case where v, where x equals zero will make it equal to zero. And if I can find a function like this, which is always going downhill, so where, where v dot of x is less than zero until v dot of zero equals zero, then that's going to be enough to show that x, some technical conditions that I'm just going to try to brush past here, that, that we're going to be able to show that x goes to, to the origin if we can write a function like that. That's the Lyapunov function in here. Okay, so I know sorry, most of you, or some of you know that very, very well. I'm sorry if that was slow. But the, um, okay, so, so what I want to do today is use Lyapunov functions to analyze local stability of, um, of nonlinear systems, and I'm going to write programs that, anal that, that do this Lyapunov analysis for me. Okay, so, so let me do one more example just to, so you appreciate the computations that are about to happen in MATLAB. So let me just think of uh, another dynamical system that we can analyze. So if I write down um, one of the simplest dynamical systems that's nonlinear, I'll do x dot equals negative x plus x cubed. If I can, that's a polynomial uh, differential equation. Uh, that happens to be one I can draw because it's first order. I can draw here on the board. I can just draw a plot of x versus x dot. And I know what this thing looks like. It's, it looks like negative x around the origin. And then it looks like x cubed, so it does something like this. Okay. So if you look at Steve Strogatz would recommend just gra analyzing this thing graphically, graphically, and I love that way to think about it. So I can just immediately tell you what the system's going to do. Everything about it. This, by the way, crosses at 1 and negative 1. Right? Um, so I know, for instance, that this x dot is positive here. The velocity is positive. That means in this region, the flows are going to be going to the, to the right. In this region, x dot is negative. The flows are going to be going to the left. So I know that and this, when it's at 0, this is going to be a fixed point of the dynamics. And that's going to be a stable fixed point because the neighboring points come to it, right? And this one is also 0. It's a fixed point. But if I look just to the right of it, it's going to, trajectories are going to move away. This one too, they're going to move away. So those are unstable fixed points. So I immediately know that there's one stable fixed point of my system, of the system, that x dot equals zero. And even more, I know that the basin of attraction of that fixed point, the set of initial conditions that are going to end up at that fixed point, is exactly the set that's that's x in negative one to one. Right? Those are the initial conditions that are going to land at that fixed point. Right? Okay. So I, let's make sure I get the same answer with my with my computations in just a second. Okay. Um, you know what? So 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 I, I forgot to do the Lyapunov part. Of it. So so if I want to do the same thing, if I want to estimate this this uh, this stability with a Lyapunov function, then the first thing I have to do is come up with a scalar function. Um, it turns out for for this system, if I were to linearize around the origin, 
this term will just go away. I get x out equals negative x. Let me just jump ahead to say that a good Lyapunov candidate that you get from linear theory would be to guess that v of x equals x squared. Okay. And if I compute, so this is always greater than 0, that's good. If I compute v dot of x, which is partial v partial x times x dot, okay, then that's going to be what, 2x negative x plus x cubed, or negative 2x plus 2x to the fourth squared there. And this thing, if you look, is negative exactly when it's inside the region of attraction and goes, starts going positive outside the region of attraction. So if I look at the place where this Lyapunov function is a valid Lyapunov function, it exactly is a valid Lyapunov function when x is in that same domain. So this is a Lyapunov argument which proves, independent of that graphic analysis, the same thing, that the region of attraction of this fixed point is at least negative one to one. It turns out we know that that's an exact replica. Okay, so the manipulations I had to do to make that work turned out to be pretty simple, right? So I had to ensure that this thing was positive, and I had to ensure that this thing was negative over the region that I cared about, okay? So it turns out, the Alpinov analysis is about checking positivity of functions. Okay. The Alpinov stability analysis, in this case, is directly related to checking the positivity of a function. So let's think about it happens to be a polynomial function in that case. So let me give you a couple quizzes here. So uh, is 1 plus 2x squared greater than 0 for all real x? That one's, that one's pretty easy. Yeah, that's all. That's got to be. What about this one? So that one's a little harder to think about. I'll go ahead and show you that it's easy to think about if I just rewrite it in this form. That's, those are that's just factoring out in a different way. I can write it in this form, and now I can see, well, this thing's positive, this thing's got to be positive, this thing's got to be, that's a sum of squares, that's got to be positive. So I'm all set. What about that one? This is not artificial, this is actually the first pendulum example I'm going to run. Let the computer solve. Okay. Uh, what do you think? Is it positive? I, I thought you might guess it was positive, so I subtracted two. Okay. <laughs> so if you add two back in, then it's positive. But other, you know, so so that, that's harder though. But luckily, the computer's going to run through that really fast. Okay. And here's how it works. It's the sum of squares optimization. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that the decomposition of a polynomial into a sum of squares decomposition turns out to be something we can do really well with uh, positive semi-definite programming. Okay, so here in the example, if I were to just rewrite this in a matrix form and put some vector of monomials here of things that are you know, one x here, and write a matrix times that same thing, uh, then as long as this matrix is positive semi-definite, then that is a sum of squares. That's exactly the same as me writing out the factored version saying that this is a sum of squares decomposition as this. Okay, and so more generally, if I had chosen a different monomial basis, could be that I have to search over the class of semi-definite matrices subject to the constraint that these equality, that this, this, this side equals this side, which puts some constraints on one of those coefficients. It, because the only one that can contribute to this term is A11, so A11 had better be 1, so on and so forth. But here's the trick. The set of positive semi-definite matrices is a convex cone. It's a convex set. So I can you have two positive semi-definite matrices, you add them together, you get another one. That means it's a set I can search over very efficiently. And these are linear constraints on that convex cone. So it turns out we have very good optimization packages for solving that. Okay? The positive semi-definite matrices is a convex set. You can optimize objectives over that. Convex optimization, some people use it to say the problem is solved once you find a convex relaxation. I won't go that far, but I'll say that it means we get, if there's a solution, we'll get it efficiently, and it will get the global solution, okay, unless the number of decision variables is comically too large, or the conditioning of the problem, there's a few things that can still go wrong, but finding a convex uh, formulation is, is normally a pretty good thing. There's a, still a gap that I just want to, sort of as a disclaimer, not every poly positive polynomial can be written as a sum of squares, but most can, and for the purposes of the Lyapunov analysis, we, we assume that there is no, we basically act as if there is no gap. You can almost always find them. There's, there's some theorems that are emerging now saying that any, any stable polynomial system 
should have a poly, uh, sum of squares positive, uh, the odd and odd function with even sum of squares derivative. Okay, so let's take, see if we can take the sum of squares now, this ability to search over positivity of polynomials and use it to automatically discover the odd and odd functions. Okay, so if I give you a polynomial dynamical system, now if you want to prove it's stable, what you have to do is search over the alpha functions which are positive, that's the sum of squares to the string, and it says that the derivative, which is a, the, the gradient of a poly polynomial is going to be a polynomial times another polynomial, this is still a polynomial, less than zero, that's just two sums of squares constraints, and we can use sums of squares optimization now to discover a B that proves stability of the system. It's not just for polynomials, the theory is deeper for polynomials, but we do it for trigonometric functions by working on the quotient ring and, and doing all these extra things too, but so, so if I were to work that exact example now with sum of squares, so I have b equals x squared, right? Is that, I'm not even going to bother making a sum of squares constraint on that. I know x squared is positive, okay? But this one is more a little bit more subtle. Is, is this thing, the question is, is this always greater than zero? Well, I don't want to ask that question. I'm going to ask an almost equivalent question. Can I write a sum of squares decomposition of that? Uh, it turns out I can't, right? This thing isn't always greater than zero. But I can play one more trick to ask, is it greater than zero just in the domain negative one to one? And I'm going to just put it up quickly, but you can restrict the domain in these optimizations using things like the S procedure, um, which gives you, I don't, I'm not going to go through it, but it gives you a, a simple, another simple, it's like a Lagrange multiplier problem, another simple sums of squares problem that you can solve this is restricted to that domain, and that will say yes. I can find the region of I can search over the optimum function by putting three parameters in my, uh, my the optimum function and then asking to opti maximize the sub, you know, these parameters subject to these constraints and it'll fill in these parameters. Okay, so the optimum analysis is cool. It works for these things on the board. If I go to look and apply it to a perching airplane, even a pendulum, then the math gets really hard really fast. And in, in practice, people haven't used the optimum analysis enough for nonlinear dynamic robots because it's hard to conjure the off and off function. These tools fill a possible a perceived gap in the ability to automatically generate the off and off functions for these systems. Okay. Um, just so you, know, so you understand that it's fast and good, let me just run a quick example, right? So this is where the tools are basically to the point where um, I just type in now, I say, here's my dynamics, x dot equals negative x plus x cubed. Uh, what's the region of attraction for it? And they run, you know, run really quickly. So this is just basically instantaneous. It says, yeah, the region of attraction is. It had, this is the this is the the, the Apollon function that it generated, which is the same one I used on the board. X squared. The the row is just a, a telling you it stops at one. <coughs> um, but so that's cool. So that's a trivial example. We could do that on the board. I can do it for pretty complicated examples too, pretty fast. So if I run, for instance, a quad rotor. And I take a, a dynamic model of a quad rotor and ask what's its, and I'm going to stabilize it with a linear quadratic regulator and ask what's, re, what's its region of attraction. I'll do that here real quick too. Most of the time it spends actually generating the plot, but this is the region of attraction of the quad rotor with saturation constraints. And it's just it's get a sense of the dynamics. It's going to just simulate the dynamics a few times. But that ellipse was a plane of the six-dimensional, it's just a cross-section of a six-dimensional construction, which was the level set of a Lyapunov function. Go over that system very quickly. Okay, so I think they're good tools. I think they're they're useful tools. Um, they work well. Uh, we had, so the, those tools grew up in, in systems theory. And Pablo Brios at MIT he did a lot of the initial connections between uh, sum of squares optimization and systems theory. Uh, you know, we've come in and. and made them work for robotics, basically. That's sort of my, what I feel like my role has been. So, uh, you know, we do it, we extend them, for instance, just to work for uh, funnels around trajectories. I'll tell you that story graphically. We, we do them with higher order the optimum functions. We have to, up to quart, quadratic or quartic. Um, so uh, we can do it with saturations, state constraints, obstacles, motor saturations. Uh, the robustness analysis is pretty straightforward with these, we, we, you know, if you have Uncertainty in your in the dynamics of your system. I don't know if my mass of my quadrator is 1.5 or, or 2.5. I can do that. If you do it uh, with sines and cosines, you can do it directly in trigonometric. Um, 
I'm really proud of the ability, we can do it now for hybrid dynamics and for limit cycles. So we can do these for walking robots, regions of attraction for walking robots. And we've been increasingly doing stochastic versions of the algorithm. I'll tell you a little bit about some of these as we go forward. So let's just think about the, the pendulum example now. So if I were to take the pendulum, um, look at the dynamics around the top, linearize the dynamics, and design an LQR controller, then that controller, uh, and, and limit the gain of that, of that controller. And that controller is going to work where the linearization was a good approximation. At some point, it will go too far and it will fail. So the Lyapunov region of attraction analysis of this will carve out a conservative approximation. You know, everything inside this ellipse is guaranteed to be stable to the fixed point. It could be that the real region of attraction is a little bigger, but this is a conservative, fast approximation that proves that every initial condition in here subject to the LPR controller will make it to that unstable fixed point at pi zero. Okay. <clears throat> but if you want to do more than that, uh, linear control at the top might not be good enough. One of the ways we would do more than that in robotics would be that so if we wanted to swing up from the bottom, we might plan a trajectory with the motion planning to get it to swing up to the top, okay? Maybe we even stabilize that trajectory with time varying feedback, and we'd like to compute something about that, you know, somehow prove the stability of that motion too. So we can now do the same thing where we, we now compute a finite time invariance. So if I, you know, what are the set of initial conditions around this initial condition that will stay close to this trajectory and make it all the way to that other um, region, and we can compute that efficiently with the same tools. Okay, and stability is not required for finite time problems, of course. The notion of optimizing volume, and this is more complex, but we, we've got some heuristics. We can do higher order Lyapunov functions. Some people think that when I say convex optimization, that means that I can only look for a, you know, convex regions. The, the region is not what has to be convex. We can find this is an artificial vector field created to have the true region of attraction be known and squishy, elongated. And we come up with you know, pretty good approximations pretty quickly with the algorithm. The yellow is the approximated region of attraction. Okay, this is just another example of a, of a known uh, region of attraction that we estimate pretty efficiently. Um, if you want to do robustness analysis, it fits in. The Lyapunov analysis has always been good for robustness analysis if, you, if you're willing to do common Lyapunov functions. So you just ask, I'd like that. So now if the, the dynamics might, be, might have mass equals uh, one, and mass equals two, as long as for every mass in, my, in the possibilities, it's always going downhill on this Lyapunov function. If I have one Lyapunov function, it's always going downhill. That's called a common Lyapunov function. That proves robust ver verification. And so this is just an example of the quadrat or uncertain mass doing uh, robust verification. You can handle saturations and obstacles. In fact, you can even handle them sort of as a post-processing step. So I can take a plain flying through a polygonal forest, compute what its region of attraction or its finite time invariance around a trajectory would be without the obstacles and then just trim it away to match the obstacles. We've got efficient algorithms for that. How we fly MATLAB planes through forests. Um, we can do it directly on the trigonometric verification or we can do Taylor expansions. It turns out the Taylor expansions aren't that bad, uh, so we do them a lot in practice. This one, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm really proud of being able to do it uh, regions of attraction analysis for limit cycles. So um, <clears throat> we do it with a construction that basically designs uh, a moving coordinate frame around some periodic trajectory and cre create a Lyapunov function on that moving coordinate frame. I'll spare the details, um, but it's still a um, it's still a Lyapunov analysis. The Lyapunov candidates are still generated with the Riccati equation. Um, and we can handle hybrid dynamics in this too, as long as our construction, constructed coordinates line up with any switching surfaces. <laughs> I thought about that, if that makes sense. Um, and what it gives me the ability to do is, for instance, take my walking robots. This is one of the simplest walking robots we think about. It's called the compass gate. It's got just two legs, straight legs, pin joint at the top. But it's cool because you can put it on the top of a small ramp, give it a push, and without any torque, it's just a passive walker. It'll walk stably down a small ramp. One of the examples of passive dynamic walking. And it does it with relatively few assumptions and just assume that the torque, there's no, well, we can put torque in the hip, but this one had no torque. We just assume that there's pin joints and hybrid transitions for the feet. Okay, so that, that, that um, robot, if you will, it has no, no controller in it, but that robot it goes, undergoes a stable periodic motion that's punctuated by these hybrid impacts. So we have to put hits the ground. There's an instantaneous change in velocity. The legs switch from the, the left leg being the stance leg to the right leg being the stance leg, and then it repeats. Okay? 
And we knew that the region of attraction of, there, there, there was some region of attraction of this from the passive system, but we couldn't compute it. Uh, but now, now we can with this construction. We can, we can efficiently underestimate the region of attraction of these hybrid load cycles. What's particularly cool about it is the compass gate is um, hard, most walking robots are hard enough, you can't actually solve the closed form for that periodic cycle. I can't integrate the return map of the system. I can't, I can't do analytic computations on these walking robots in general. But it turns out, the, even if, the numer if we use a numerical uh, approximation of the periodic trajectory initially, I can still get an exact verification, analytic verification of these regions around the trajectories. So it allows us to do formal analysis on limits like this, even when we can't integrate the dynamics of the system. All right, so that's just that's the first piece. I wanted to tell you about this idea of using optimization to compute the Leopold functions. It works pretty well. So the, the the scaling is polynomial in the number of decision variables. Uh, the decision variables are polynomial in the number of states, uh, but it's a fast polynomial. Sure. Yeah. Um, so in this last uh, hybrid story, yep. you're doing things numerically. Are you actually doing a numerical 4K transformation, computing numerically the monodromy and the logarithm of the monodromy? We don't have to do that anymore. So, we'll so in, instead of doing explicitly that, you're able to calculate the uh, yep. appropriate solution to the Leibniz equation associated with the logarithm? Yes. So, 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 so here's the idea how. So um, we construct a moving coordinate frame around the trajectory we computed nominally, uh, uh, numerically. Um, but we analytically verify at every, so, we, so first just think about computing finite time invariant, or invariance of this set. So on the edges, we have to verify the Lyapunov function is going down. We can verify, we have an analytic description now as a spline representation of this cone we're trying to verify. We have the dynamics analytically becomes a point-wise verification that every point is going downhill on the Lyapunov, standard Lyapunov trick, okay? And if we've done that everywhere on the cycle, we've proven stability, local stability of the limit cycle without ever integrating it. And then if we want to, uh, if we want to prove stability contraction to the manifold, we can do it, we can't do it to uh, tolerance if the numerical answer was wrong, but we can, we can do it up to some small epsilon ball, for instance, verify analytically that the Lyapunov function is decreasing up to some numerical margin around this. So you said you can efficiently do interior estimates or underestimates. So presumably you're growing the gray region as, as big as you can. So what's the process by which you grow? You must have done some initial guesses, but you're improving on the guesses. So global Lyapunov analysis is a convex optimization. There's no guesses required. For local Lyapunov analysis, you have to do some sort of iteration typically between a, well, depending on how you parameter, but there's a convex parameterization. But the typical one, if you're searching over the Lyapunov functions, it's a bilinear problem. So we do typically use a Riccati or Lyapunov method to come up with, use the linearization to produce initial guess, and then we blow it out using a bilinear search in the convex optimization. And these bilinear searches we found to be very efficient. I mean, there's no guarantee that it gets to the global, but there, it's convex optimization, convex optimization, and it seems to be pretty well formulated. And in all of this, you use some sample uh, spline fitted version of the nominal cycle? In the limit cycle case, we do a spline, uh, yes, and so the Lyapunov candidate might not be the optimal one, but the verification of it is exempt, right? It might not be the biggest region because we have numerical errors, but once we have an analytic description of a cone we want to verify, a tool we want to verify, that verification is exempt. Sure. Yeah. Um, we do these time invariant regions up to about 11 states. Uh, Uku Kaku, the Caltech, he says he's doing 15 or, or higher. And actually, I think people are, are I mean, the, the, there's great work on semi definite opt uh, optimization nowadays. I, it sort of feels like these things are going to get really big numbers really fast. Uh, we've been doing the trajectory funnels up to six states. We haven't really tried to go higher, but that's the biggest one we've tried to do. The biggest problem with it is that is numerical conditioning. So. Um, you know, the most common failure of these tools is, sorry, I encountered numerical difficulties, but we've been working on trying to resolve those. The only real fundamental limitation I feel of them is that fundamentally these are tools for analyzing smooth vector fields. So I had a about smooth this this morning. Um, and, and it assumes it's convexity. So for instance, it's never going to tell me in my airplane example uh, if I'm gonna, whether to go left or right around an obstacle, right? Um, and even the pendulum swing apart is very simple. 
um, pendulum controller that does energy shaping to swing up to the top, you know, there is no smooth Lyapunov function that proves stability of that system. So I think fundamentally the thing that they can't do yet, uh, or maybe won't do, is, is this analyzing non-smooth, non-convex problems. And I think the power, the resolution, the real power of these things comes when, they, when you put them together with trajectory motion planning. I, I'm biased. Um, there's very powerful tools for robotics. Many of you use these. Um, so from trajectory optimization, that, that's not even for robotics. That's from the aerospace engineering from a long time ago. And uh, my favorite is direct collocation. Um, <clears throat> uh, we use also randomized motion planning, which maybe grew up in robotics. Um, I, I guess a lot of you know trajectory optimization, just in case anybody doesn't think about randomized motion planning, let me just motivate it quickly with this, uh, this cartoon. So a trajectory motion planning, if I said I wanted to start from here to here, and if I had some initial guess of a trajectory that, that sort of went like this, that's going to have problems because we have this bug trap scenario. The trajectory, if you just try to go directly towards the goal with some sort of gradient method, the trajectories are just going to slam against this constraint and never find a solution. And the robotics community has embraced these seemingly sort of stupid ideas of randomly throwing down these dense trees, um, but they, in practice, work pretty well and can solve pretty complex uh, problems and will eventually, with probability one, find their way out of even pretty complex bug traps. And you could use that now as an initial guess that would, that would be smoothed by a trajectory optimizer. So these things have the possibility of working for really pretty complicated problems. Um, we've done a lot of work trying to make them work more efficiently for systems that have dynamics. Just an example of the pendulum, but it, uh, we can make them work a lot faster with some simple knowledge and heuristics about dynamics. And that sort of culminated in our ability to now take a model of Little Dog. Uh, we spent a long time doing system identification. Uh, we built a dynamic model of a planar version of Little Dog with accurate foot slip. And little Dog, we spent so much time on this stupid dog. The, 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 <laughs> Um, so this was the one that really got us. So you take the dog, put him on a, on a step like this, drop him, okay? Uh, it would bounce twice and then slide, right? So the friction model that made that happen was just ridiculous. But uh, we, we got it right, you know, eventually. Uh, it turns out there was some interplay between the, the springs and the legs and the, and the ground reaction forces. But we have a very accurate dynamic model, okay? And now we formulate the problem. This is just like the bug trap. We just go say, okay, your initial conditions are here. The dynamics are given this model. I want you to get here, okay? Go ahead and, and solve it, right? And it's a really, really hard problem. There's all these options of feet getting stuck here, but we can, in a few minutes of computation with these random uh, algorithms and the dynamics, modifications for them, we can plan these pretty aggressive trajectories over the obstacles. And <clears throat> once we have a trajectory, we always know how to stabilize them. We've gotten a little better at stabilizing trajectories recently. We always use, well, that was the other guy's controller, actually. Um, the, uh, you know, we use linear, local linear controllers around trajectories to stabilize these things. It turns out it makes a big difference if you use the same construction of a transversal coordinates around a limit cycle, so you're not stabilizing in time. So that, this is an idea that came from Sharia, that, we, that makes a big difference um, to stabilize trajectories in the transverse coordinates. And we, can, we can make, you know, so the blue was the actual trajectory, the red was the other guy's controller, the green is um, our controller but also subjected to adversarial disturbances. Every time his foot hits the ground, we give him an impulse like this, like, hi, you probably didn't know where the ground was just for kicks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you up and he didn't recover pretty, pretty robustly. All right, so here's how we put it all together. Okay, so I've got my pendulum. I know how to make trajectories now. I just showed you we've got good tools even for little log type robots for making trajectories, and we know how to make funnels, okay? So here's how it goes all together. So uh, I, I told you we can make the funnels around the trajectories. You should really think about these as, I guess I already said the word funnel, so you should really think about these not, think, not just as regions. The Avanoff functions have a beautiful image as funnels, okay? So um, think of it, that function V of X, which is always going downhill, as a funnel in state space, which takes initial conditions here and brings them down the tube, right? Takes initial conditions here and brings them down the tube. So if I have a funnel that I've computed, which takes initial conditions here and brings them to the goal, and if I can design another funnel that goes around this trajectory, subject to the constraints that this funnel, the output ends and the inlet of this funnel, then I can start putting everything together. Let's think of that as another funnel. Then I can start putting all these things together. I can start with the initial swing up trajectory that gets me to the goal. And now I'll do a randomized algorithm to just try to make a better controller. Okay, so I'm going to pick a point at random. 
When I pick a point at random, if it was already in somebody's funnel, I can just throw that point away. I don't need it. That one's already taken care of. If it was outside, I'm going to design a trajectory now that tries to get back. It doesn't have to get back all the way to the goal. It just has to get back to one of the other trajectories I've already solved in the system. So it's a tree that's being formed. Okay? Uh, and then I'm going to compute the stabilizer for that and compute its funnel. And if I do that a few times, and the claim is with just a handful of, of trajectories, I'm going to fill the space with these funnels. And actually, the claims of filling the space are, are, are fairly strong. It, it gives probabilistic feedback coverage, is what we're calling it. So there's a set of initial conditions, which is in the, retail, the, the, the controllable space, where there is some solution that will take you from that initial condition to the goal. And we can claim that we will, as time goes to infinity, that's the weakness, as time goes to infinity, we will get every initial condition that can get to the goal, will get to the goal with this controller. Okay, so because any finite measure region in the controllable set that's not in somebody's funnel will eventually be sampled, even at random, and then eventually be <coughs> retrieved by good trajectory application. So we can construct artificial examples where the, you know, we know that the system can't cross this red line, it's supposed to get to this goal, and the algorithm will just start populating this, approximating this red line with ellipsoids in that case, that was the representation we used that day, and it will eventually fill that space. Right. So this is always assuming controllability for that statement. But we, but there's extensions. I mean, there's obvious things you can try to do there. But uh, the default statement is for control. Yeah. Although the, of course, the trajectories don't need to be controllable. The fixed point needs to be. Um, okay. So, so this works for a lot of the systems that I care about in life. The you know, underactuated systems. You introduced me to saying I worked a bit on that. Uh, carpools, acrobats, these walking robots, right? So this is just a, a simple example on a carpool. Whenever the light turns on, then he's it's running the controller. Okay, and it's not, this is, you know, lots of controllers that will stabilize this. It's a little harder with the, um, you know, with the constraints on the cart, but it's, it's not a hard problem. It's just nice to see that the algorithm really works on the real system. And it works not just getting, getting to the top, but it actually, um, you know, with, with, with the proper models of the carpool, it never leaves a funnel that it started in. Uh, and this is how we did perching, okay? So um, for the perching plane, we spent a long time build, building the model of the post-all dynamics. Once we had that model, all we had to do, well, but what we had to do was just take, a, take some novel condition we care about, design a trajectory that gets you to the perch, close that, you know, stabilize that trajectory with even linear feedback, and then pick, find a new point in the initial condition that we care about that's not in our funnel so far. We just add it back to the, um, the nominal tree now and add it to the, the plan. Then we just fill the space. We don't have to fill the whole space because this is a, a seven dimensional space. We don't even claim we ever fill that space, but we pick some small, volume of space that we care about in initial conditions to make sure we fill that, and that works. Okay, so that just takes my MATLAB line drawing approximation of our perching airplane and makes it from initial conditions. Sorry, from, from initial conditions to the goal. And it works for walking. So the story in walking, I think, is sort of natural. So I have this, you know, this nominal limit cycle that works for the compass gate. Those are sort of, if I'm walking along, I've got small perturbations, the nominal stability of my system can work for this. And then what I do when I'm trying to design a better controller is I start sampling initial conditions. If I find one that's outside of my funnel that I care about, you know, if I get this, if someone pushed me into this initial condition, then I just have to design a trajectory that gets me back to my nominal plan, stabilize that, add it to the tree. And the claim is you should only have to find a few of these sort of weird recovery motions, and you should be able to fill most of the space. So I can sort of Intuitively, it's natural for me in walking. You can do it, we're increasingly ma making it work. Um, we've got a very product that's sort of alongside Sean's um, project that we're trying to, to do fast flight through forests now. We're doing these same computations now. If the constraints didn't become known to us until runtime, suddenly uh, we just were just told there's a tree in front of you, what do you do? The, the uh, sum of the squares verification I talked about is fast, but it's offline so far. So it's running on my laptop. Um, it's not running on an embedded processor and whatever. Um, so can we still do all this provably stable flight? Well, the, the answer is we've changed the funnel computation a little bit in this case so that we pre-compute, verify continuous families of parameterized funnels. So we have a motion planning library now that says, 
okay, I can do this maneuver, I can do this maneuver, I can do this maneuver. They're all continuously parameterized and, and verified ahead of time. And then in runtime, you just pull from that something that satisfies the, the runtime constraints and goes. <clears throat> There's another problem, which is that we're trying to, not only we're trying to fly through the forest uh, at high speed, but we have to do it with vision in the loop, right? So I have avoided vision my whole career so far, but this new Gary has got us working with vision. Uh, and you think this thing that you proved all this, all these nice theorems about, about stability, and then someone gives you a vision sensor in the loop, and it just breaks everything, okay, right? So vision is not nice to have in your control loop, I think. Well, it will be if, if, we, if, if, if Sean and everybody figures these things out, right? So uh, this has now got a nonlinear vehicle model and perceptual uncertainty, maybe wind gusts throwing it around. Um, you know, typically, if the uncertainty in the world is bounded, then we can do our robust control design and verification problem is vision systems don't make bounded errors. It's, you know, vision systems are going to say, sorry, I didn't see that tree, or you know, <laughs> it was a shadow, but I thought it was a tree. It's like you know, they're going to make very long, very big errors. So I think it's hard to, to use a robust uh, verification to talk about vision errors. Um, plus, if the, if the bounds on your robustness are so large compared to your control authority, robust design isn't going to be a useful solution anyway. So, We've increasingly been changing our, for that project, thinking about stochastic verification. And the Lyapunov story works actually surprisingly well for the stochastic case. Okay, so there's a direct analogy uh, to Lyapunov theory for stochastic systems. If I can find a scalar function now, I have a stochastic dynamical system, if I find a, a scalar function which the expected value is going downhill all the time, it's called super martingale, okay? And you can still use a super martingale to bound the probability of leaving some region. The same way as it used to be, I, I got set in variance. I used to say, I never, I'm never going to leave this region with probability one. Now, if the expected value is going downhill all the time, I can use some Markov inequalities to get a, a bound on the probability of leaving some, some level set. Okay? And it turns out we can search for those with the same sort of optimization. It's a harder search because Lyapunov functions are very flexible. So Lyapunov functions. If I find one Lyapunov function that works for a system, I can multiply it by two, I can multiply it by, you know, I can, I can do things to it, and there's still going to be a Lyapunov function to the system. The, in the stochastic verification, the steeper the function we verify, the tighter my bound. So I've got a lot more incentive to, 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 to look over a smaller class, or a tighter class of functions. Um, so we do it by, by now looking over uh, exponential quadratics, or exponential polynomials in general, which are sort of the fastest growing thing you can involve with a Gaussian. If you have a nonlinear system with Gaussian noise, it's sort of the fastest growing function you can involve with a Gaussian and still get a, uh, an analytic form out. Do you need the equatorial bound of JP? Um, just positive definiteness. No upper bounds in the right term or uh, Unless we missed something, I don't, I don't think there's any upper bounds. Wow. I mean, far away uh, in time varying system settings, we're trying to do something like the plow, then the sort of these invariance theorems, you need the time the derivative to be bound above by something that is not time dependent. And it's not just it can be negative, it's bounded above by something negative and time independent. Right. If you want to leave the JK in there, so somehow conservatively you want to bound that by something. Right. Okay. So, so we don't consider sort of adversarial JTs, but I, I agree. So, so in, in our statement of the theorems, we're careful about all these, uh, these things. But in practice, JT is you know we search over, we try to minimize things on it, and it's a bounded search over positive days. Right. Yes. And in fact, most of the cases we've done are with static numbers too. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> Right, so, so so far we're doing height estimates of finite time stability for model systems up to, well the other thing is you, you can only talk about probabilities, probabilistic stability over a finite time, because these, if you think of a system with Gaussian noise, eventually it's going to always leave some region, so we look at finite time stability. Okay, so here's just an example, take that quadrotor model, add some wind gusts to it, so here's a, and now it's being buffeted by wind, and we ask the question, you know, if I were to draw some, some region like this, you know, in six dimensions, um, then can I bound the probability of leaving that region subject to the wind gust model? And uh, it, it, so we ran this optimization, took about five minutes for eight states on, the, on our computer, and it, it gives bounds that I'm pretty happy with. So for instance, if you, we can say if you were to let that thing run for an hour, this is a slice from the 
any dimensional stochastic basis, it says, for instance, if I were to start with the initial condition at zero, the probability of leaving is 0.2 over n. Now, how do you judge if that's tight? We, for, the, for lower dimensional things, we've done Monte Carlo evaluations to check tightness, but for me, to see that we, we thought about this thing over an hour time course, and it wasn't zero, and it wasn't one, that made me very happy, because these things, these are diffusion processes, you either get a, you know, you, you either blow up very fast or you, you don't blow up very fast, so, so getting a 0.2 after an hour is good. So the whole theme of this um, is that the, I think that the efficient verification leads to better control design. I didn't really care about Lyapunov functions uh, until I convinced myself that that made better controllers. Proving the thing's stable, that's good, but, it, but only if it makes controllers work better. So um, in this, in the stochastic case, it's sort of clear that, 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 that doing it in a closed form way can be much faster than Monte Carlo and give good bounds. So maybe that gives us new possibilities for control synthesis. So uh, you can now explicitly optimize the controllers or even the vision systems to, to try to maximize regions of attraction. Um, and, and you can start building, you know, by virtue of making the, the trees and the combinations of funnels, you can make better controllers. Okay, so <clears throat> that's, the, that's the basic story. Let me just sort of tell you what I think are the weaknesses. Okay, so the biggest weakness I think is that it's a very model-based approach, right? So we spent a long time doing this idea now, but I feel like I, I didn't want to have to spend as much time on, right? So, the better our model, the tighter our bounds, you know, the, the less robustness analysis we have to do, the tighter our bounds, the higher performance our controller can be. Um, we're doing, you know, we're, we're tracking state space trajectories, it's good state estimation, another thing I didn't want to spend a lot of time on. Um, you know, it's, it's, it makes sense. I mean, you shouldn't expect to do very high performance things without a model, I think, but, uh, but it's, it's a burden. Uh, and in general, I think control of underactuated systems are very model dependent because, it, you know, if I don't have an actuator co-located with a joint, I can't just squash nonlinear friction terms and stuff. I have to worry about the friction of these other joints. Um, we've been working uh, theoretically on system identification and practically the theoretical stuff with Alex McGretzky is pretty exciting. We can do, um, uh, we can fit, using the same tricks, we can, we can search over a class of stable, you know, by simultaneously looking for a Lyapunov function and a fit to data, we can search over a class of stable nonlinear systems to find things that fit the data. Um, <coughs> But I think ultimately we're going to, you know, in the next few years, we'll be further exploiting the natural connections between these things and the robust design and analysis, doing better jobs of integrating with um, integral quadratic constraints, doing loop shape. We do all the things that robust control people know how to do into this framework. Okay, so um, I told you a story about how verification put together with motion planning can be good. It can enable rigorous and practical feedback design, I think, for pretty hard problems in robotics. Um, I showed examples of like locomotion. We've done some manipulation. I talked a little bit about the navigation of quadratic environments, right? Also, there's this, you know, for the motion planning side of things, if you're a motion planning person, it's nice to say you can actually do so. I can apply formal tools from from, uh, from control theory to the, to the problem, but also there's a simple motivation that planning with these funnels allows you to have very sparse trajectory libraries. And I think we can improve, uh, start achieving high performance at the limits where we're dealing with saturations, we're dealing with all these complexities without sacrificing all the theoretical guarantees. So I want to just end with uh, some sort of fun videos of what's coming next. So um, this, this MIRI project we're, we're working on um, is we're trying to do high-speed vision-based flight control through the forest. So we had this awesome collaborator at Harvard, Andy B. Winner, some of you might know him. Um, he, you know, he got the project started by taking pigeons, sticking motion capture markers on their head uh, and their back, putting a camera on their head. Birds don't cicada with their eyes, they cicada with their heads, so you, if you know where their head's pointed, you know where they're looking. And he flies them through these PVC forests, okay? So we have three calibrated data sources. We've got the, the external high-speed video I was about to show you, we've got the motion capture, we know where he is, and we've got the onboard camera, we've got all this calibrated data flying these guys through the forest, and they're just so fun to watch, right? It's flying through the forests, the synthetic forests. And now we can do experiments like moving poles on them and all these kinds of most of the time they're pretty graceful. Every once in a while they just smack into a bowl. But uh, <laughs> um, the other big project we're doing now is we're trying to build a robotic ostrich that runs at 25, maybe even 50 miles an hour. Uh, the reason I think we can do it is we think we got this collaborator, Gary Pratt, who is fantastic. He's got a leg design that's ultra light, has no motors in the leg, it's just a passive leg. He's swinging with his hand here, and the ground speed 
it's 50 miles an hour, okay? And just by putting clever tendons and levers and locks in the leg, he can, he has this, so this thing can achieve uh, ground clearance of more than 50% of the leg length for more than 70% of the duty cycle, so it can run over things, okay? Um, and it's just being shaken by his hand right now, a very light leg, um, and we think it's gonna run, yeah, very fast. This is our initial simulation of a robotic ostrich. This is a planar dynamic model, fully dynamic model, uh, that's running at 20 miles an hour. Mostly just driven by a motor here, and, uh, and tendons through the legs. Now this terrifies me, the bandwidth requirements for the controller, the model requirements for the controller, but the amazing thing about this video is that all those, all these videos that you're seeing right here are all open loop stable. So the leg is smart enough, it's, it's got springs in the right places, it's actually open to stable running. Right? So you can see it runs over this kind of stuff here. So now I think the burden has been reduced a little bit for the control system. So we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm also sort of having these nightmares now of coming into lab and just seeing like a, the imprint of the robot on the wall. You know, sort of why the kids, you know, do, we don't really have space to work on that, but we're going to try. How many actually are there? Just one in each other. Okay, I'll take any questions. Never do this for something. If the Lagrangian of the system gives me a parameterized 
set of, uh, of equations that I can fit the parameters to, I will do that every time. That's what we actually did on the robots we had. And, and typically what you're left with then is fitting nonlinear friction in the joints. This is sort of the slot turns on top of the Lagrangian. In other systems, in the fluid systems, that we're not given the gift of a Lagrangian plus parameter model to begin with, we, I think it's more natural to do black box identification. Now the, the fast runner is sort of a funny in-between. So this, this leg has so much friction and ball bearing and sliding, I, I actually think that's going to be the first system that looks Lagrangian that will probably make it better with black box identification. But absolutely, if the Lagrangian is a good starting point, we'll use that and, and not think about rational plane windows at all. That's just, that's just to capture the stuff that we don't have a good parametric guess for. Yeah. So you, you do have the idea of having a component of things that is physics based and then a component data there. Absolutely. I will do whatever it takes to make it work. <laughs> yeah, no question. Others? Other side